go ahead and hit record and I'll let you go ahead and start, Johnny. Um, so I guess as we get started today, uh, the objectives of the webinar is to uh, identify common health concerns, um, identify barriers to health equity, um, discuss solutions to overcoming those barriers, address the needed policy and cultural changes, and of course, provide resources and tools uh, to promote health. And all of these objectives, of course, are related to uh, minority, minority health concerns. Um, as we get started, we will watch uh, this minority health story, Michelle, who is in the uh, greater Baltimore area, but as you're watching, you'll see it's, it's a very good introduction into uh, minority health, some of the challenges that are faced, um, what that looks like. So if it kind of helps pull that all together. All right, and we will see. I have not shown a YouTube video while in this format. So can you all see it? The world has got to change. Uh, I cannot. Okay. I lived in a community that was so prosperous with doctors and lawyers and politics. We can see it now. Now we have drug dealers and corner stores that they don't sell anything but the wrong thing. You cannot deny the impact that it has on people's health. I have been in West Baltimore. My Um, so we can't hear the sound anymore. So. Healthy meals. When my oldest went to college, she came back with a different diet. Now what happens is if I do a meatloaf with turkey instead of ground beef, you know, I make spaghetti, I make chicken, stuff like that. It's with turkey and chicken. We grew up, we ate pork. Um, we ate bacon, we ate a fresh shoulder, we ate pork chops. I did not think it was not healthy eating, right? Because this is what we were accustomed to. I, I was in denial. I didn't want to face the fact that I was becoming a diabetic. The impact is the fact that my family ended up with heart disease, emphysema, diabetes, cancer. My mother's sister, her daughter died of diabetes. She was an amputee. My mother died of a massive heart attack. And to address health disparities, we need to understand why they exist, that they're not due to one single factor. They're the result of policy decisions we make as a society. They're due to the environment, health education, insurance and access to care, access to healthy food, and stress. Those stresses are actually experience disproportionately by people who are poor and people who uh, have been historically disadvantaged in this society. Solutions to these problems do not just be medical, they're systemic. And that means everybody has to get involved. If we want the nation to be strong, the people in that nation have to be healthy. They have to be well. If there's anything that we can do to stamp out disparities, we need to do it by any means necessary. Hi, Ms. Simmons. Here at East Baltimore Medical Center, most of the patients are underserved. Michelle is a terrific success story. There was actually a year where she had lost her job and before she found a new one, she had no health insurance. And she still managed to buy her medicines out of pocket, paid out of pocket to come and have doctor visits. She was really invested in her own health. That's something that Dr. Cooper's research is looking at, why patients don't invest in their health like we wish they would. Next thing on the agenda is the community update. Michelle joined our community advisory board in 2011. We provide education to the community about health and about research. We offer training programs for community health workers. We can be sure that we are meeting the needs of people appropriately and that we're not leaving out certain groups of people that have traditionally not been included in conversations related to health and health care. 
our strong relationship with the community is just essential. There's no way that we could do what we're doing without their input. And my work is just one of many initiatives here at Hopkins. Ms. Simmons is a great example of what happens when we get it right as clinicians and as an institution. I am a fighter. I am a believer. I stand for what's right. And what's right is people's health. And I will never give up as long as I have breath in my body. One of the things that is so important is that people have what I call a liberated future. And it's hard to be liberated when you're not up there. But I say liberated, I mean freedom to be all that God meant for you to be. When we don't deal with disparities, then what we're doing is denying people an opportunity to give back to the world. So we've got to fight it. We've got to fight it with everything we've got. All right, let me get back over to our PowerPoint. Okay, is that sharing for y'all? Yes. Awesome, yes. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I guess I will continue. I'm not sure where or how we will play off, but um, hopefully you all were able to see with that video um, Michelle's stories and essentially um, her story, I guess, kind of shows you some of the challenges that are faced, um, how she faced those challenges. But of course, she approached it and made changes um, to better her health for herself. Obviously, there's an example in there that kind of showed um, her daughter who went off to college and was exposed to um, different social determinants, actually what we're kind of talking about here now, and I'll kind of go over that in just a second, but um, essentially where, she, where you live and work. So that's what social determinants are um, versus just regular like risk factors or genetics, whereas social determinants of your health are those things that um, essentially are around you, where you live, where you work, and the availability of those things. So obviously the examples that are listed here um, economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, um, food, community and social context and healthcare. So for example, under economic stability, um, your income or your uh, employment. So what does that look like? What um, does the economy and the community that you live provide? Are there, are there jobs available for there to be employment? Um, what does the income of that employment look like? Um, does it av avoid you enough to provide as far as expenses. There was an example also in that video where she spoke of making the decision to purchase medications uh, versus purchasing something to eat. Whereas I think many of us know and understand that actually those two things are actually kind of necessary. You usually with most medications need to eat before you take them, right? Um, and so that is an example of how social determinants um, can dictate you know, our health. Um, additionally, neighborhoods and physical environment. So what does your environment look like? So are there walking uh, sidewalks? Are there playgrounds? So is it there for you to take part in it? So if it's there, then you can work on those other behavior risk factors. You can walk if there's somewhere for you to walk. Are you walking on a gravel? You know, what, what does that look like? Uh, what's available in your, in your area? And of course, education, I feel like I'm kind of going through every, every last one of these, and I, I will try not to because I can start talking and just talk and talk and talk. Um, of course, food, what does that look like? So um, I feel like I have, when I say I, myself, of course, um, have examples of these different things because I just, I'm, I'm pretty well-rounded individual. I'm from Tuscaloosa, live here in Tuscaloosa, but I have friends and family who are kind of all out. So when you Think, think of access to food, you don't think that that would be a thing, but that definitely is a thing also. Um, I have some friends who were down from, I forget exactly what county that is, but down there, Selma, maybe Marion, some county down there. Um, and one of the only grocery stores that they had closed, I think last summer. So of course that is another issue. Um, that's not, not access to just being able to get to groceries um, or having those healthy options, of course. So a lot of these people now, um, have turned to getting the next best thing, which is purchasing food from Dollar General, or like, what does that offer you? You know, they may have eggs, they have milk, but of course, a lot of those unhealthy options, right? Uh, so community and social context. So what does that look like? Um, people who have 
greater access to support systems, um, what do those programs look like, where they offer, and of course the healthcare system. So our example here in Tuscaloosa would obviously be DCH, uh, whereas in other cities, maybe larger metropolitan cities, they have you know several uh, health care systems that provide several different you know provider options. Um, and then on the flip side, when you have even smaller communities, uh, those options become limited to non-existent. For, for example, once again, um, I think it was maybe in the fall semester, and of course my brain th thinks on, on semester basis uh, because of education and academia, but I think it was in the fall semester when the hospital down the road from us in Pickens County uh, recently shut down, which provided services such as emergency medicine there, um, they had actually just started a behavioral health service there because um, I was actually invited to, <laughs> to be a part of that. Um, but of course, so all of those services are no longer there. So that um, is an issue as far as provider availability, quality of care, of course, even access to care. So all of these things are these social determinants, um, of course, lead to health outcome um, issues. So affecting the mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, uh, those healthcare expenditures. So, of course, if someone's having to travel even further, uh, then that's uh, an increased healthcare expenditure, even though it's not, not directly related to the cost of the healthcare, but the cost of having to get there. What does that gas look like? What is that having a working vehicle? Um, public transportation versus not having public transportation. So, all of those things, um, as you can see, or hopefully I'm making the, the picture for you, how those things all uh, will affect someone's health. And I would just add to that, you know, when we think about providing health care and access and all of those things, like Dr. Tice mentioned, those social determinants of health, sometimes we're really relying as healthcare providers on the, you know, the system, the paperwork to pick up on some of these things and for us to review those. And so it's really important on the provider side of healthcare for us to do a more intentional, uh, you know, outreach to the patients that we encounter and make sure that, you know, what we're being, you know, given in terms of information is helping us see the whole picture of what their life is like. Um, I think it's so important, particularly when we're taking care of people who do have these, you know, large gaps and health disparities, that we're able to see what their life is like. And when we do see that their grocery stores are closed down, or, you know, on the more rare occasions now where we have home visits for different things, um, that's where it's so important, like home health and hospice and even like early intervention programs for children. And the reason I think that those are so helpful and that they're so effective in helping those families and patients is because you're seeing where they're living, you're seeing the roads they're driving down, you're seeing, you know, whether they have access to, you know, fresh foods by the grocery stores and surrounding areas. You're seeing what their home is like, you know, do they have running water? Do they have issues with, you know, mold or infestations or, you know, are they having, you know, access to care issues? Do they have a nearby neighbor that can check on them? You're really getting to see the whole picture of what that patient's life is like. And oftentimes when you're having people come into a doctor's office or you're having them come into the hospital, you're not seeing that. You're just seeing, you know, one aspect of their lives. And so if they don't voice some of those concerns or some of those issues, um, and if we're not as providers really, you know, taking time to ask those questions beyond what's on the paperwork, we may be missing those gaps. And so for us and for those of us on the call today, you know, we may not have some of those same issues, but just by offering education and creating awareness, I think that's where it's so important and where people like Dr. Tyson, his practice, you know, in the clinical area is so beneficial to our community because um, because he does look at those things and does advocate for our patients and especially from that holistic perspective if not just the physical body and health but also the mental well-being and so um, that's what's so great about what Dr. Tice does for our community so I just wanted to jump in and add that. Oh you could I think I may jump in again as well just while we're selling this slide I think the um, another importance of this slide and I, I'm not 100% percent sure um, the makeup of the individuals who are, are on the call here, uh, but I don't know. I, I would think that not everyone are healthcare providers, um, but I think that 
having a better understanding of what these health determinants or social determinants are um, will allow you to do a evaluation of yourself, but also of your community. Um, so make sure you think about what's available, what do these, you know, are there walking trails, playgrounds, parks, and of course, this will provide you with some um, areas that you may want to go back and talk to your um, area councilman or whoever, you know, because as we will move forward, we'll talk about policies and things like that. Um, but these are things that you want to, um, or these are things that you can, can address that will help to make, you know, the health equity for everyone. Yeah, healthy communities and healthy people. That's such a great tie-in. All right, let's see if we can get to the next slide. Um, I guess, so very similar to previous slide, but a little bit different. Um, so of course, genetics, we do not have any control over. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, as we are progressing, like today, in today's time, we are learning more through genetics, genetics testing, um, genetics is it's a very, very big, I mean, it's always been huge, it's always been big, but I think we are becoming even more advanced with um, genetics and what we call precision medicine um, is, a, is a, a current term for that. And of course, we cannot change who we are genetically, but um, if we understand who we are genetically and what that looks like and can, can learn what that is early on, we can essentially um, live a healthier and better life and live a longer life. So of course, longevity and years of life is, is, is another thing as well. Um, I guess as far as examples with that, I'm sure everyone has heard of like the 23 and me, um, like the ancestry, ancestry, excuse me, um, which, you know, allows you to learn who your family, family members are, um, what your heritage is, essentially your ethnicity, different backgrounds. If you, um, all these, it allows you a lot of information, but of course, um, it could also kind of help you understand uh, what you may be pre predisposed to because of these different things. Um, a more specific genetic um, situation or testing that I am familiar with um, is we use some testing in the psych world to decide which uh, medications specifically like your antidepressants, um, your antipsychotics, and medications for pain management um, it kind of tells you which ones work for individuals. So it's like a swab in the mouth that you do really quick. Um, and it can tell you, it kind of runs through the list of the different medicines and tells you which ones are essentially good or bad for people. That's like a green, yellow, red. So like a red uh, stoplight situation. Um, and it's broken down based upon like the metabolism or how these individuals metabolize them. Uh, so are they super metabolizers? Are they standard? Are they, uh, you know, slow metabolizers? Um, and kind of tells you which ones are best and how they will work. And so you're not playing a guessing game uh, with individuals in health. Um, and I've actually found it to be beneficial as both a clinician and as a patient. So I definitely know the benefit of using that. Of course, once again, um, having access to those things um, are connected to things, of course, such as um, having, you know, health insurance, which a lot of times is connected to, you know, your, your job once again. Um, but in a lot of cases, a lot of employers now do have the coverage that covers those things. Um, the environment, we kind of talked about that. Well, I don't think, kind of really didn't talk about that. So environment, when I think of environment, um, I actually grew up here in Tuscaloosa on the west side of Tuscaloosa. So I'm very familiar with all of these things. Um, there's, there's, you know, plants and manufacturing places. So like today you think of a lot of the plants that are out of dance, such as Mercedes and the suppliers, but even here in the heart end of the city of Tuscaloosa, you have, um, or at least on the west side of Tuscaloosa, you have the BF Get Rich manufacturing plant, which uh, produces tires. Um, so you have to think about those plants that are in the city, not outside the city, not in the county, but in the city, which is producing these toxins, of course, which essentially is, is, is a, um, a health care outcome um, determinant as well. And of course, socioeconomic status, um, education, access to these things. What are the cultural norms? So, you know, we cannot um, change and or influence that. So I think that ties back into the example of the daughter who went off to college. Like I said, a lot of these, I think it's easy for me to talk through this because I feel like this is me. Um, I know who I was before I went to college, before I went to the University of Alabama, the things that I did, the things that I ate, the things that I was exposed to um, versus 
after going to college, you know, having that experience to see, to interact, to live with, to work with um, just several different individuals. Like what is, what was eating sushi before I came to college? You know, all these different things. So it's, it, it's kind of, you know, you, you write, you, you remain, you retain those cultural norms of what that looks like. But of course you are exposed to uh, the culture of others. And I think that's very important as well. And of course we all, have some level of implicit bias, whether we agree to it, whether we say we do, whether we acknowledge it or not, it is there. Um, and so, you know, we have to do our best to um, address that and to come at, come into um, situations or all situations and everyone that we work with, you know, and, and trying to eliminate that as much as possible. And Abby or Ms. Horton, I'll let you <laughs> kind of chime in. I feel like once again, I went on my, my talking spree. No, that's exactly why we wanted you to be here. You have such a great wealth of knowledge and experience. And I would just add to that, you know, the, the environment part, when we think about um, food deserts and we talk about, you know, ha not having access, which the example you gave in Selma was a great example of, you know, so many people are, you know, actually going and getting their groceries either at a gas station or a Dollar General. Uh, you know, or a small business grocery store that doesn't have much access. And so um, we also can think about food swamps. And that's a new term for me, but, you know, having food swamps where it's the, you know, the greasy fast food restaurants. And so, you know, you've got the food desert in this sense in these same communities where there's no fresh foods in grocery stores. There's not, you know, the, the really healthy, you know, fast food options. Um, or, you know, quick, you know, grab and go restaurant options, but then you have the food swamps where there aren't those grocery stores where you're going to have the fast food chains, the ones that we can all think of, and, you know, they don't have very many healthy options, even their options like salads and kids meals and things. Still, when you look at the calorie count, the trans fats and those things, it might be a salad, but it's not a healthy option of a salad. And so, um, you know, that's where another part of the environment, not only your home environment, but the community around you and what resources you have access to. And that's where policy can come into play because, um, you know, it's not on the responsibility of these, um, you know, individuals in these communities that don't have resources. It's really our collective responsibility as citizens, as healthcare providers, as people who have access to, you know, some great resources. It's really our responsibility to make sure that when policies are being put into place that we're protecting the most vulnerable um, citizens in our community. And so, uh, you know, we need to advocate for those grocery stores. We need to advocate for less fast food options that don't have, you know, healthy um, meals that they can buy. And then, of course, you know, improving that access because it is cheaper to eat off the dollar menu than it is to go and buy organic fresh foods at the grocery store. And so um, those are just some things in terms of what we can do, even if we're not directly impacted how we can help advocate for the the families and the, the people who need us the most right i think it's like helping others navigate i think a good example of that i was thinking before they started how could i give an example of what this looks like so say for instance you and i were driving you know we are driving but as we drive we don't know what roadblocks are ahead right um but if we had someone who was even ahead of us who were calling us to say hey don't turn on mcfarland there's a roadblock there right so if there's someone who can help you navigate this, and of course you'll get there uh, without these roadblocks, you won't be stopped, you'll get there sooner, faster, and probably, you know, in, with, in better situation versus if you don't have the help, if you don't have someone who's ahead of you, um, who can say, hey, you probably should do this, you should do that. So I, I think that's maybe a good analogy, but I was just kind of thinking like, how can I think about this? Um, but yes, yes, yes. I do, I love that analogy. I think that's great, you know, when you, are kind of ahead, you can reach back and help others. I think that's Absolutely. a great, great analogy. Um, so these are just essentially some definitions. So the first one on the left is the Robert Wood Jr. Foundation definition of health equity. So health equity, equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be healthier, right? So this requires removing obstacles uh, to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs, um, which includes fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and of course, health care. Um, 
the second definition, of course, as we think of health equity and the outcomes, we know that health and well-being are nurtured, right? Protected and preserved where people live, work, and play. So I think these two definitions essentially encompass uh, the dialogue and things that we have set up until now, and we'll continue to support those as we continue to move forward and things that we, we discuss and talk about. Um, whew, so common health concerns, and I'm like, I don't know, of course, everything about every last one of these, but number one on the list and number one in the nation is heart disease. Another number, heart disease is the number one killer of, um, cause of death, excuse me, I hate to say killer, we will say cause of death. <laughs> that was not a good way of saying that. Uh, heart disease is number one cause of death in the United States. I think it's like one in four individuals have some type of heart disease. And what does that look like? You know, it can be several different variations of coronary artery disease, um, different regions, but heart disease is, is what that is. Um, of course, diabetes, um, hypertension and stroke, cancer, obesity, depression, cholesterol issues, and environmental exposures. And for a majority of the um, health concerns, these for many reasons, um, are more prevalent in your minority population. So uh, once again, when we go back and think about those different social determinants and we think about the different um, genetics and just lifestyles and cultural no norms um, lead to a lot of these things uh, that you know we can work with and adjust. So um, diabetes and heart disease and um, hypertension and stroke, a lot of these are definitely those top three um, are all cardiovascular, they're vascular. So whether they're microvascular or macrovascular, they're, they are vascular issues. Um, and a lot of times can be, um, can be, can be, um, excuse me, what am I trying to say, can be um, prevented and or managed better um, based upon decisions and lifestyles that we make of course, once again, we have to think about the context of what that looks like and how they can be adjusted. Um, you know, cancers a lot of times um, are more, more genetic connected usually. Sometimes they can be uh, triggered by different environmental exposures, once again, um, and different things related to that. Um, obesity, um, in many cases, you know, we, we um, think that this one is definitely more one that is self controlled. However, there are um, other reasons why individuals are obese, so we have to think about that as well. I think a lot of these, especially specifically these bottom ones, so depression, anxiety, stress, cholesterol, triglycerides, environmental exposures, um, I guess we would not do our due diligence or uh, we'll be remiss to not mention currently um, what these things look like in the time of COVID, right? So, um, of course, many of us well, for many months now, I think we are slowly, of course, at this point, opening back up and doing more things um, with precautions still in place, of course. Um, but, you know, we were, when I say we, because myself, of course, included, um, at home and during these times, maybe eating probably not as well as we should have. Um, there's definitely um, an increase in the mental health um, disorders or mental mental health issues uh, secondary to COVID, and that's uh, on many, 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 many levels. So, you know, ourselves, myself, Mrs. Horton, uh, healthcare providers, as you can imagine, have had a high level of uh, stress and anxiety and understanding what's going on and trying to do our best to, to take care and help the population. But of course, in many situations, there are some, you know, things such as delayed grief. You really can't, you don't have a chance to to kind of process everything. And of course, even family members who are, who, like I said, at this point, things are a little bit different, a little bit better, but if you can imagine, if you remember, you know, many people were not able to, to go see their family members there. And of course, things did not stop and people were still uh, passing and dying during this time. So they weren't able to be there with them when they passed or, uh, you know, going through these different life stages. And so once again, that sets people up for, sets people up for depression, anxiety, and delayed grief. Um, which leads to other things such as, you know, self-harm or thinking of self-harm. Um, there's, there's been many cases of things such as um, increased domestic violence and spouse abuse. Um, I think there's increased levels of stress related to, once again, I don't have this example on hand, um, but everyone who, is, who have school-age children who are having to process 
um, this new learning environment, which essentially this new environment is the home. Um, I think many of us, even obviously, as you can see, I'm sitting at home um, during the COVID time. I had to set up a home office uh, to continue uh, my productivity. And I found myself uh, having to be more intentional with boundaries and setting boundaries and limits and times and cutoffs. So I think, you know, the, the mental health aspect was, is something that has really been uh, affected with, with COVID. And of course, like I said, those other things that we may have had um, a little better control over if we were able to go walk or we were able to go to the gym or we were able to do these things that were essentially kind of cut off for a while there. Like I said, they are opening back again now. So we may have to be, you know, readjusting at this time. I'm going to let you talk again, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that you addressed all of those perfectly. And, and we know that they all relate and work together. So, you know, when we are having, you know, stressors outside of our typical stressors, like with COVID-19, when we're already having some depression, anxiety, or stress, or, you know, some, you know, numbers are not what we want them to be. They're not optimal or ideal in terms of cholesterol or blood pressure or blood sugar, you know, all of those work together. And so I think it's just a matter of looking at the wellness basics that we can do to really take control over our health. And so when I teach the wellness aspect of these classes, I always tell people to really start with managing their stress, their sleep, their hydration, their nutrition, you know, not a diet, but how they're nourishing their body and movement, like purposeful movement every day, even if that's not exercise, and then mindfulness or meditation. And those are kind of the basics of what you need to do to really start to get control over some of the more lifestyle modifications that you can do. And I always encourage people to start small, you know, start with one or two things and really start to look at, you know, what you can add in that's healthy versus taking something away. I always say, especially when I'm teaching students, I always tell them, you know, our brains like to add, they don't like to subtract. And so <laughs> if you can add in good stuff, then it's going to naturally crowd out the not so healthy stuff. And um, that's a fun, silly, simple way to remember um, because we don't like to say that we can't have a donut or we don't like to take away our Netflix or TV time or what have you. But if we can add in really good things like exercise or meeting a friend for, you know, a walk or something like that, you can start to make those changes. Um, and kind of on the next slide, it ties into this, you know, some specific health concerns. You know, when we start to talk about, you know, metabolism of, you know, pharmacokinetics and um, you know, medications that we take, things like sickle cell anemia, vitamin deficiencies, you know, respiratory or lung issues, asthma, pain management, sun exposure. You know, we really have to think about what we are, you know, assessing for in terms of, you know, as a healthcare provider, but then also ourselves as patients that, you know, we might have different, uh, you know, risk factors or predispositions based on you know, not only cultural norms or genetics or lifestyle behaviors, um, but just that there might be an increased risk for those things, or we might not metabolize a medication the same way. And um, so I always tell people, and Dr. Tice teaches pharmacology, so he can speak more on this, but, you know, when we do clinical drug trials and those medications are tested, they're typically tested on middle-aged, healthy Caucasian men. And so if you're not a middle-aged Caucasian healthy male, then we don't always know the specifics, you know, in terms of how our bodies are going to respond or react. And so I think it's just important for us to remember that we have this bio-individuality that we need to honor and recognize in ourselves. And um, to know that everything that we see is not going to work for us. And so there might be a medication that's really great for treating depression or blood pressure, but it might not work well for us. There might be a specific diet or lifestyle plan that looks really great and is, you know, really beneficial for other people that might not work well for us as individuals. And so I would just encourage that you, you know, keep that at the forefront of your minds when you're going and interacting with healthcare professionals and when you're sharing what you're learning with your friends and family, you know, from this talk is that we all are individual 
Um, it doesn't matter, you know, what other, you know, characteristics that we can describe ourselves with that, you know, each person is individual and each person is going to respond differently and each person is going to have specific health concerns and risk factors. And so I just think it's important that we acknowledge that as we kind of move forward, um, you know, with this talk and with thinking about how can we help bridge those health disparities, um, because sometimes we like to overgeneralize and it's really important to really just address the concerns of the person sitting in front of you and take in their their background and their concerns. So I don't know if you want to jump in, Dr. Tyson, offer anything else, but those are just um, my thoughts. I think you did a great job. Um, I think just, I will jump back on really quickly, the metabolism of pharmacoceuticals. Um, in theory, um, when, we, when we kind of think about large populations, um, there's evidence that supports when we kind of speakly, specifically speaking about Asian Americans versus Black Americans and White Americans. Asian Americans actually usually are hyper or super metabolizing so rapidly. So a lot of times they need higher doses of medications uh, versus African Americans sometimes need lower doses because they are slower metabolizers. Whereas, of course, if you're White American is somewhere there in the middle. Um, but of course, that's kind of that's something that as a provider I, I would need to know. But it's, there's something. That could be beneficial to you. So maybe something that none of you may have heard before. And so, you know, I mean, you may be on a medication. You're like, why is this not working as well for me? Because once again, um, you would expect all providers to kind of know these things. But once again, there's so much knowledge that we're expected to know, and everyone just doesn't know everything. And pharmacology may not be that one aspect of your provider that they're just super strong in. So, um, just knowing these different things, you know, yourself, of course, your provider, it, it will help with your with your management of whatever's going on. So um, like, just like Ms. Abby, Ms. Or Horton said, um, the different sickle cell anemias, uh, different vitamin deficiencies, um, asthma, different things like that. Um, a lot of them are related to, once again, um, specifically asthma, you can think of that. Um, it's a lot of times related to environmental factors, of course, um, you know, leads you, because essentially asthma is just like having a big allergy. Um, the, you know, what's in the environment that is causing you to trigger you to have this respiratory response. Um, so those different things, like she said, being mindful and thinking about um, each individual that you're seeing or in, in, in interacting with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and asthma is one that you think of, you know, with African American populations in the literature, it will tell us that um, they often will have, um, you know, more uh, episodes of asthma, but then you have to think about like the plants and manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those are placed in communities where it's going to be disproportional. And so, you know, it, it's not necessarily that there's a true genetic cause for that. It's just maybe a, an environmental um, community issue. And so that's where we have to, again, go back to those policies and think about protecting you know, communities and all communities um, with the zoning laws and things like that. And so um, we want to make sure that we're really careful about, you know, not attributing it to a specific population. It may just be an environmental issue that we need to do something about. So that's a perfect example. Thank you, Dr. Tice. You are welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I know there's some screening okay. things. Yeah, some screening and prevention to healthy living. Um, we'll go through these pretty quickly, but these are just some annual physical exam recommendations. And so we recommend that you, you know, get screened for any medical issues that you might have and assess your future risk of medical issues. Uh, especially for people, you know, who might have some type of uh, cancer risk factor like breast cancer, or prostate cancer. And um, we know there, there's strong genetic components like Dr. Tice mentioned earlier in the talk. We want to make sure that we're encouraging a healthy lifestyle, but realizing that, you know, there are policy changes uh, that need to, and in infrastructural changes that need to take place because it's not just on the individual's responsibility um, to ensure a healthy lifestyle. We need to do that for everyone. And, you know, of course, keeping up to date with immunizations and building a strong relationship with your primary care provider. And I know Dr. Tice can speak to this because he does have a, a clinical practice or he sees patients, but it's so important that you get to know your provider uh, even during times where you're not sick. So we're not at our best when we're sick. And so if we keep those routine physical exams, you know, that's an, an opportunity for us to build those relationships so that we're not seeing our doctor for the first time during COVID or we're not seeing 
them, you know, when we're having the flu or something like that, because then we're not getting the routine screenings, but we're also not getting to build that good um, foundational relationship. And I'm just going to go quickly through the next couple of slides to just talk about some annual things that you can consider having done. Um, working with your, you know, care provider for sure on these things, but, you know, you want to have your annual physical exam with lab work. We can do a screening for Wellbama, which really gives you some great numbers, tells you about your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your BMI, and things like that. Uh, can walk through some different things in terms of, you know, your risk factors as well. And then uh, dental exams and cleanings, we would like for, you know, that to be recommended twice a year. A hearing screen, which we don't typically think about. We typically have this done when we're in elementary school, you know, K through 12. And uh, we don't often have hearing screens uh, after until we have a, an actual issue. But I do think that it's you know, important, especially if you have a strong genetic uh, or family history of hearing loss to have a hearing screen. We know that there is a hormonal component for hearing loss. So um, typically men who um, you know, have hearing loss will have different changes throughout their lifespan, not only in uh, childhood and adolescence, but middle age. And so um, women can as well, but it's not quite as dramatic. And so it's important to understand um, that if you see someone who's withdrawing or asking you to repeat information, it may not be that there's an issue of depression or something like that. It could just simply be that they can't hear you, particularly wearing masks now. It's important, uh, you know, I think we're all realizing how much we rely on reading lips to make sure that we understand or facial cues. So making sure that the hearing is intact is really important. Having a comprehensive eye exam with having that pupil dilation. So not just having an exam with an optometrist, but actually seeing an ophthalmologist and having a, an eye exam to make sure those blood vessels are nice and healthy, especially if you have risks for blood pressure. Uh, you know, high blood pressure that's controlled or uncontrolled can lead to some vessel damage. And so, of course, that's important, particularly um, with communities who will likely have higher blood pressures if it's not controlled well. Uh, cholesterol screenings and diabetes, those are all important. You may or may not have a baseline EKG, but I would recommend everyone have just, you know, a thyroid exam, which is just simply palpating your thyroid uh, with a practitioner because you can have some enlargement. And Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune thyroid condition, is really on the rise. And autoimmune tends to impact um, marginalized communities and women more than men for lots of reasons, but uh, we won't go into those today, but it's important to really understand those risk factors as well. And then of course, these are all of your, you know, standardized testing and, uh, you know, things that you would want to have done as a preventative. So your immunizations and things like that. And I'm just going to quickly go through the special considerations and then we'll open it up for questions and answers with Dr. Tice. And so, um, again, we want to make sure that we know that there are policy and cultural changes, institutional changes that need to take place. Uh, you know, we have rampant health disparities and, you know, we do have some issues with outdated medical education and, uh, and I use that in a broad sense, not just with uh, physicians, but just in healthcare in general. So we need to update those studies, the research and that education so that we know um, that there is a lot that we can do to help with health disparities. Um, there might be false beliefs about, you know, biological or physiological racial differences, um, which we know most of those are not actually fact or evidence-based. Um, environmental and social cultural health effects versus innate health and differences. There are very few innate health differences. Uh, you know, among populations. So it's important that we don't bring in that bias. And uh, again, implicit bias is important for us to recognize. As Dr. Tice mentioned, we all have implicit bias. There's a great series of quizzes that you can do for free on Harvard's website about implicit bias. If you do a simple search, uh, you know, Google search will bring that up for you. And it's not just for healthcare professionals, you know, we all have implicit bias. And so you can take those quizzes and kind of measure, you know, where, where your biases lie. And that can be really helpful and informative to you. Um, and then in health equity, you know, we're really trying to achieve health equity where we're really thinking about 
the absence of unfair or uh, you know avoidable differences in how we treat others. And um, you know this is something that when Dr. Tice kind of wraps up, you know that he might want to mention to you is you know when we think about how we treat patients and how we care for patients, um, you know we're taught in nursing school that we oftentimes will let our biases you know, really influence that, that care and that we provide care to those who are most like us. And so someone who I identify with that, you know, the, the idea is that if I let my biases really overtake my care, that I would might treat the patient who looks most like me, so maybe a 30 something year old mom with children, you know, young children, that might be the person that I would give more care to because I, you know, kind of bond and see myself with, you know, with that person. We have similarities. And so um, things like that, bringing that kind of research into our world and sharing so that we're knowledgeable about that and that we can, you know, intentionally counteract those biases, uh, you know, that's so important for us, not only as, you know, healthcare providers, because I know there's probably just me and Dr. Tice on the call that are in healthcare, but just even having that conversation with people and us recognizing that in our own practice. And then barriers to health equity, you know, having that lack of availability and access and all of these things we've touched on, but the transportation issues, um, the belief that health treatment is, is not, you know, helpful. Um, having a system that's heavily weighted toward um, you know, non-minority values and cultural norms. And so that can be really difficult for people to want to access the system. And then that, you know, racism, bias, and discrimination that can take place. It could be language barriers, health literacy, you know, health literacy is different than, than reading literacy. And so we know that health literacy is even lower than the general literacy population, which is around a sixth grade level. And so making sure that when we teach and engage with patients and others that our health literacy, you know, information is actually accessible and makes sense that we're taking time to explain things. Um, and that, you know, this lack of, you know, health insurance coverage, people can be underinsured. And so, not just that they don't have enough insurance, but they might have insurance that's just not adequate for them. And so really wanting to look at, you know, increasing the health literacy of our populations and starting to make changes in our communities to really um, equip and empower and educate people to advocate for themselves in the healthcare setting is so important. So just the toolkit of resources talking about healthy habits, and uh, we mentioned those earlier, the Wellbama screenings that you can do, um, the things like your heart health, blood pressure, cholesterol, triglyceride checks, blood glucose, your BMI, your health risk, and then measuring your activity levels. These are all things that you can do as an employee, and this is a free benefit for you, so we would love for you to participate in this. And of course, you can get some health coaching with that as well. There's some additional resources if you're interested in learning more about minority health. And um, we, again, we just, our message is just to educate and empower and encourage. Uh, we know that we talked a lot about the healthcare perspective since that is, you know, our foundation in this, but we want you to know that this is something that we all partner together uh, to really start to improve those health disparities. And we have an upcoming class on stress and relaxation on the 23rd at one. If you'd like to join in, we would love to have you, or you're welcome to watch the replay on the wellness.ua.edu website. And um, we'd love for you to follow us on social media. I did write a blog post about today's class, and it has some additional resources. And so you can head to the blog and, um, you know, follow us there and follow us on these other social media channels. And then we do have life coaching available for free. If you're interested in that, you can reach out to me at abby.horton at ua.edu for that information. We do four sessions for free if you have some wellness goals that you would like to work on. I know we're going to be at our time since we had some technical difficulties and I greatly appreciate Dr. Tice and all of the participants and Miss Nikki Bush for helping us make this possible on this other format. But now I'd like to open it up for some questions uh, for Dr. Tice and just to thank you we really appreciate you being here. You're a wonderful friend and colleague and guest speaker. And thank you so much for carving out time for us today, Johnny. No problem. Thank you.